So I took it home. It was a gallon of milk. I split it into four quarts. Rose three and drank. I'm on my fourth quart now, and it's still good. Yep. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm, I, I, I agree with you. See, I'm, I, I, do, I do care about the date, but I don't, I, I don't feel all excited about it. If it's a, a you got to kind of look at it and smell you gotta it. Check it. Although, frankly, in my family, my mother would use the, the sour milk anyway. Yeah. They used the pancakes. Right, my, oh, grandma, right. my husband's so grandmother used yeah, yeah, the sour milk. milk will right. That's right. Mm -hmm. But so many people throw away stuff because of that date, and it's just a waste of stuff. You don't know. Which chapter are we on now? All right, we are going to in chapter five of that. That's right, we didn't get all the way through that, right? Right. So. And we're actually going to deal with a question here. That's on page 20. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll move into the next uh, part of this chapter. But um, anyway, why don't we uh, begin with prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on into the, into the lesson. All right. Lord, we thank you for this time together. Thank you, uh, Lord, that you've gathered us together uh, to be in your word. Lord, I pray that, that whatever is of... Uh, the flesh or whatever is of sin or temptation of the devil that would fall to the ground and die and be able to look at. Holy Spirit, be our teacher today and show us what we need to know. And uh, Lord, I pray that the conversations that we will have here uh, would be for the building up of your kingdom in us and in others as your word is planted deeply in us and bear fruit for eternal life and bless not only ourselves but all those that we meet. And so we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, God bless y'all, and um, we will we will start here. And I basically I think where I want to start with is this: we we talked last time about uh, Ananias and Sapphira, and they're they're lying against the Holy Spirit, and and the the incredible result that came from that, and that they both they both were punished, they both died uh, because of that. And um, one of the things that uh, we need to see here in verse 11 of chapter 5, you know, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. And we, we talked about what it means to be the church and how the church is called to be a community of integrity, uh, being obedient to the Lord. And we're also reminded uh, that the Lord is wonderful, he's good, he's gracious, he's kind, He's our redeemer, but he's also holy, and so uh, we don't we don't trifle with God. There's a reverence that that we need to have uh, if we're going to be about doing the business of the kingdom uh, that He has for us to do. Now, with that in mind, uh, howdy. With that in mind, uh, we'll start at verse 12 and go from 12 to 16, and then I want to deal with the question that's on page 20 here. So. Um, let me start with uh, Jack. Are you uh, are you able to read today? I think so. All right. If you'll read verses 12 through 16 of chapter 5 for us, please. <clears throat> now many signs and wonders were done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high honor. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and pallets, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All right, thank you. Now let's, let's turn to... Uh, question number seven, here if you will. What page you got? Oh, I'm sorry, page 20. Page 20. Question number seven here. All right, and I'm just going with, the, with what the question says here. All right. Uh, what blessing and power flowed from the church once the evil of Ananias and Sapphira had been removed. Miracles and 
years. All right, and and they were regular. Actually, they, they were they were continuous, and they were even to the point where, um, like like when Jesus was was on earth, his shadow would pass over people, and they would get healed. So and and also uh, there's great fear. Not 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 dread, but respect and awe towards the church, towards those that were gathered, even when people didn't dare to join them. Nevertheless, they held them in, in high honor. Uh, so the, the question here then is uh, actually the, the the thing that the statement that's here in number seven then is discuss the importance of effective church discipline today. Now, what that means is that, you know, you, you see uh, Ananias and Spirit, they're not the only ones, uh, I'm sure, who were, who were uh, walking out or stepping out, but these two had, had the, uh, the unfortunate honor of being the example. And, and so uh, what, we, what we have here then is, is, a, is a question about church discipline. And what this is saying is that, you know, when, when Peter heard about this, really, through the Holy Spirit, he dealt with it. He didn't just let it hang around. He dealt with it. And so that, that leads me to want to have maybe a, a discussion a little bit about the importance of dealing, dealing with, with, with uh, disobedience and sin you know, in the church. And so, if you will, for a moment, let's look at a couple of examples of what happens when sin breaks out. Uh, one from the Old Testament, and then one from the New. If you look at Joshua chapter 7, for a moment. Joshua chapter 7. And yeah, we're going to do the whole chapter. But uh, Joshua chapter 7. Got it? Comes after Joshua chapter 6. See, I left two chairs in front of you. So the chicks can come up this like that to me. My mom didn't raise it up too. <laughs> I can start in again, you know. All right, anyway, moving along. You just bring a stick next to <laughs> bring a stick. Oh, oh, she has her cane. Did she bring, you didn't even bring the cane, did you? No. Oh, praise oh, the Lord. I really got good today. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, the discipliner. Anyway, the, um, let's, let's start at verse 1. And it was okay, I'll just read through this. All right. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zab Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Now what you need to understand is that they had just taken Jericho, and God has said, there are certain things you can't touch. They're devoted to destruction. You don't handle them. You don't take them. You don't make them your own. Because if you do, then the destruction that belongs to them falls on you. So you, you leave that stuff alone. Just let it burn. Okay? All of these things, by the way, has something to do with pagan worship. Leave it alone. Let it burn. Okay? And Joshua sent men... Uh, from Jericho to Ai, which is uh, near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up, spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up there, 
uh, from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shemarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan? O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So, all right, here's the, here's the point up, up to this. This one guy decides after Jericho falls, you know, I, I want some of this. I'm going to hold some of this for myself. And he takes it. And his sin, remember he's part of a worshiping community of Israel. They are the, earth, they, they, they are the first church. All right? That sin, even though it's, it's, it's a personal sin, he did it on his own. All right? His family might have been in on it, but nevertheless, just him and his family, nobody else knew about it. That sin had consequences that affected the ability of the people of Israel to move into the promise that God had for them. And one of the things we need, the reason I, I, I picked Joshua out just as an example, is that in, in, in some aspects, the book of Joshua is, is a, 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 a prophetic picture of what Jesus does with the church. In fact, it's not an accident that, that the Hebrew in Joshua is Yeshua. And the Hebrew for Jesus is Yeshua. They're both Joshua. Okay? And they're both leading the people into a land of promise. But the people have to listen. And God says, Joshua, you know, if you obey my voice and do, do what I tell you, then all this is yours. And all this people of Israel, they can have it. But they never quite were able to enter into all the inheritance because they kept breaking faith with God. And one of the things here is that when the Lord is leading the church and in the promise, and into the kingdom. We are called to keep faith. And if we don't, and we cover up that sin, then we we don't enter in to all that he has either. It can affect us even if we're not we're, we're not directly responsible. Now we find out later on, and we don't have to read the whole chapter, but God says, look. Call the people together, and I'll show you who did it. And then they pick out Achim. Achim confesses, and they destroy him and everything he has. In order to, to pay for the crime. And that, that sounds like a harsh sentence. But on the other hand, he was told already, don't do it. Because it will you'll, you'll be destroyed. And his sin ended up 36 other people died because of because of his sin. So discipline's important because if you just cover up the sin, then even if you're not directly responsible, there's a block that keeps us from moving further into what God God would have us. All right. Now, by the way, I want, I want you to notice something. In Acts and here, you will find that it is God who directs the discipline. That's very important. Because if we decide 
on our own to find out things. We're acting in the flesh. We won't really know. We need, we need the Holy Spirit to show us what needs to be dealt with. So they're being directed by God. That's very important because here's the thing. If we just decide on our own what we're going to discipline, what we're not going to discipline, that, that's not really just. And very often we'll leave off sins that, well, we don't really think that's all that bad. This is terrible over here. And we're going to deal with this. No, it's all terrible. Let the Holy Spirit move. Now, the other one I want to show you is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Chapter 5. Right. First, first Corinthians chapter 5. Start the first verse. Okay, let's we'll start there. And um, it's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and read. You guys can follow along, if you will. First Corinthians chapter 5. I'm starting in verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. What's going on here is that uh, there's, a, there's a young man who is in a sexual relationship with either his mother or his stepmother. One of those two. Okay? And the congregation is going, oh, what? Well, yeah, this is okay. Grace covers all. You know, and we, we, we have people do that today. It's nothing new. They were doing it then, too. All right? It, it's, you know, it, 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 God is gracious and and, and this, this is fine. This is fine. Actually, they're celebrating it. By the way, do we have congregations celebrating things like that today? Not maybe incest, but we're getting close. But anyway, we got people celebrating all, all kinds of nonsense. St. Paul says you should be mourning instead of celebrating this. And then, and then he says something that's not politically correct today. He says, let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now, notice he doesn't say, remove the woman. Likely, the woman is not a member of, of the congregation. Likely, she's not even a Christian. But he is. That's why she's not even mentioned here. But he's the member of the congregation that's doing it. For the absent in the body... I am present in the Spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my Spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the name of the Lord. In other words, you're going to remove him from the congregation. He wants to live like the world, let him be in the world, but he's not going to be here. And the hope is that he's going to be so uh, beaten up by the world and see the error of his way that then he'll repent. And then once he repents and confesses his sin, then you can bring him back in. But but he can't be he can't be in while he's doing these things. You know, uh, not not long ago, well, actually, has been a while now. Um, I would say maybe 10 years ago, uh, as congregations were considering uh, what to do about their nominations that were going to bless homosexual unions and, and all this other stuff, there is one 
Lutheran congregation, I think it was in New York, and uh, they were concerned about what was going on. And uh, they, they, uh, they were discussing it at the council, and there was one, one lady there who was absolutely thinking, well, there's no problem with this, it's okay, you know, it's just fine. And, um, which, I mean, they tried to convince her that, you know, we're not in favor of this, but she was all right with it. And then, and then she came out, excuse me for that, but she came out, not as a lesbian, but she came out uh, as a publisher. She was part of a magazine that was publishing pedophilia. And when they confronted her with that, they said, well, well, but you're part of a congregation of the Church of Christ. Why, why would you do that? Why do you think that that's okay? And they, and they did what Jesus says to do. They, they tried to admonish her to repent. She wouldn't. Two or three witnesses, she wouldn't. Finally, they brought it to the council. She refused to repent. So then she was removed from the council and removed from the congregation. And, uh, but because discipline is, is not universally applied, and you can go to any congregation you want, she just got up, went to the SELC, and congregation she could find. And that was fine. So discipline, though, was needed in that situation. And what you find there is, is that um, this is the reason that, that St. Paul gives for it. In verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now, understand that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, leaven is used as a symbol for a number of things. But primarily, the primary way it's used is as a symbol for sin. Just as a little bit of lemon can go a long way, so just a little bit of sin, tolerated, embraced, celebrated, will infect the entire lump. And and then and then you can't get it out. You just have to throw it, throw that, throw that out. And here's what here here's the point he makes. All right. Cleanse out the old lemon. That you may that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. So what he's saying is that you're you're like the unleavened bread. You're holy to the Lord. You're like Passover bread. You're like the bread that uh, that would be on the on the they had they had the bread of the presence in the temple where you had uh, twelve loaves of bread that were there before the Lord to represent the children of Israel. They were all unleavened unleavened bread. It was holy. Leaven, in that instance, would represent sin. And so he said, look, you are you're, you're called to be holy. You're not called to be raised bread. You're called to be holy. And that means that, that you, you cannot allow this to remain in you because if it continues and you don't deal with it, then human nature being what it is, all of a sudden we go, oh, that's just a little thing. And then the next thing comes up. And that's just a little thing. And that thing comes up. Well, that's just a little thing. And the next thing you know, uh, you, 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 you completely raise that you're not any good for what God, God called you to do. It's called, you know, in one sense, another, another image of that would be like, uh, if somebody told, told this, uh, uh, call my attention to it. It's like, um, what do you call that? The, the boiler frog? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, if, you, if you take a frog okay. and throw it in boiling water, it's going to hop right on out. All right? But if you put a, a, a frog in, in water, room temperature water, and just increase the temperature ever so slightly, that frog will not move, and eventually that frog will cook. And that's what that's what happens when, when when you just let a little bit of sin and time come in 
and you don't get out, eventually your body, the, the frog's body gets used to the temperature, gets used to the temperature, gets used to the temperature, and then it, it croaks. <laughs> and it croaks. So anyway, I get your meaning, but I mean it was very funny, gross. wasn't it? Wasn't that funny? <laughs> no. No. Anyway. So, but that's that's the reason that you you need to deal with it right away. You need to deal with it right away. And then finally, uh, let's look at uh, Matthew eighteen. Matthew eighteen. Matthew 18. And I'm starting at verse 15. By the way, this is the scripture that is often used in churches in their constitutions when they talk about church discipline. It's also the scripture that is most ignored very often when it comes to that. All right. But this is the scripture. So let's look at this real quick. And you're going to find an explanation, Eddie, as we deal with this, okay. about your question about binding or loosening here. Okay? Hey there. Welcome. All right. So we're talking about one of the questions here that was on church discipline. Okay. We're in Matthew 18 right now. Okay? You're doing fine. All right. We're in Matthew 18. Verses 15 through 20. Take a sip while I'm waiting for you to get there. Hold on. Is it okay to write in your Bible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I do all the time. I got, I got all kinds of things here. Yeah. yeah. Mark it up. <laughs> Mark it up. Take notes. Do what, you, it's being used. do what you need to do. It, does not, it doesn't defile it. I said I'm writing in my Bible all the time. No, there's nothing wrong with writing in the Bible. I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 the, the only problem I have with writing in the Bible is they don't have enough pages. Oh. <laughs> That's why I like to use my iPad so that I can underline and then I can just type and keep typing the notes. But yeah, no, it, it, the, there, are, there are lots of examples where people throughout the ages have written in their Bible, written notes in the in the margins so that they can remember the lesson that's ordered there. So that's perfectly right. Just do that. All right, uh, verse 15 through 20, chapter 18. Our Lord Jesus said, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. By the way, our Lord Jesus there is, is making a pronouncement that's found in the law of Moses. In the law of Moses, you never, ever, ever bring someone with a charge without two or three witnesses. Your word's not enough. You must have two or three witnesses that can confirm every word. All right? Absolutely. So Jesus is, 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 is holding to that. You need to have at least two or three witnesses. Eyewitnesses. Not people who heard you say. I, they were there. We need eyewitnesses. Okay? And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. In other words, a Gentile here is not a Gentile believer, someone who is not in the church, or a tax collector, someone who... Remember what a tax collector is. See, you and I may not want to cozy up with the IRS, but the IRS, well, they're getting there, but the IRS still has not yet become like the tax collectors back in that day. Because the tax, tax collectors there were, were actually traitors to the, to, the, to the Jewish population 
they were working for the occupying government and they were they were able to tax you at whatever level they wanted to. So if Rome was saying tax you at 10%, they could tax you at 30, keep the rest, and there wasn't a thing one you can do about it. Because Rome said that's fine, well we get our 10%. We don't care how much we charge. So in this in this, by the way, in this in this instance, please note that that while Jesus preached to tax collectors and sailors, and, and, and one Matthew, who's writing this, was a tax collector. Jesus has Jesus is making it clear here that tax collectors, uh, he, he reaches out to them and seeks their salvation, but they're still what sinners. He's not reaching out to them because they're not sinners. He's reaching out to them because they are, and they need to get saved. By the way. Uh, that also is a reminder that if we're going to treat them as Gentiles and tax collectors, then what's our attitude towards unbelievers? What are we supposed to do as a church? And do what? Love them and, 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 and love them in what way? Witness. Witness to them. Bring them back to the truth. They need to repent. They need to come back. So, as communicating them doesn't mean that you have absolutely zero to do with them. But what it does mean is that, okay, evidently, you haven't gotten the program. So, we're going to bring that back to you in the hope that you will truly repent, truly believe, and truly come to faith and get right with God. Okay? But in the meantime... They're not communing at the table. They're welcome, they're welcome to come and listen, but they're not members. Okay? Is that not the ultimate issue? I mean, then and now, the truth. Yeah. They can't accept, they, they, the world does not accept the truth. No, they don't. They don't want to hear it. That's why it's interesting. Yeah. It's the question of, is this true? Yeah. Well, and, and the thing is that you have uh, the, the problem with talking about truth is that we very often fall into what Pontius Pilate said to Jesus. What what is truth? You know, I have mine. You have yours. Uh, as if there's no absolute God-given truth, and there is. I mean, whether they want to believe it or not, it's still it's still there. Um, you know, I like to tell people this, you know, gravity is still gravity whether you want to believe it or not. You know, jump off a building without a parachute, I'll call the ambulance for you. <laughs> if they can still find you. But... Because the truth can hit them in the face and they still want to... And they still won't accept it. They still won't accept it. Alright, so... But here, verse 18, alright? Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on her shall be loosed in heaven. Now, our Lord Jesus actually uses that saying in a couple of different contexts. In this context, what he's talking about is binding and loosing with regards to church discipline. Whoever you forgive, I forgive. Whoever uh, you hold the sin is still against them, the sin is still against them. So there's that binding or loosing there. You can be loosed into forgiveness, or you can be bound until you repent. But that's what this is talking about here. Now, there is another context where it's uh, where, uh, in, in Matthew 16, where he's talking about using the keys in the kingdom and binding and loosing there, and that has more to do with spiritual warfare. Because the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So, in that sense, it, it means that you can, uh, by his authority, and at his sovereign moment, uh, you can loose people from the power of the enemy. Or they stay bound, depending on whether they, 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 they come to Christ or not, whether they're, going, whether they're going to repent or not. You know, I, I'll give you an example uh, that I, I heard from a brother. Uh, somebody came up to him once 
and, and he, he was having a real problem with lust. And he, he really felt like he was oppressed by, by a demon on that. So he said, um, he said, Brother, uh, Brother Prince, I, uh, I think I, 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 I believe that I'm oppressed by a demon of lust, but I rather like it. Can I be delivered? And, and, and the pastor said to him, nope. Because the Lord has not come to set you free from your friends. He has come to set you free from your enemies. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to hate that thing, like God hates it, then you're ready. So he wouldn't even pray. He, he would pray for other things for this guy. He's not going to pray deliverance. Mm -hmm. Or he's not prepared to hate it like, like God hates it and just release it. So there, there's some of that too. In this context here, it's talking about forgiving or retaining their sins. And in, in John chapter 20, uh, you will find there uh, that Jesus says to the, um, to the disciples in the upper room, uh, what, you know, if you forgive the sins of many, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of many, they are retained. So that's more in line of what you're, what you're saying here. I have a question. Okay. Okay, so obviously, you know, we're not perfect and we all make mistakes with the things. Mm -hmm. But what if someone is, like, still bitter towards you and you're forgiven, you know, you have forgiven them, but they're still not forgiving you because what you did was wrong or they just, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. So is that something that's going to be holding you and them back? Because It won't hold you back because you forgive them. And then do you just pray that they can... You, you pray for them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you forgive, um, you're, you're releasing them and you're fine. All right. But... Uh, that doesn't guarantee that they have forgiven or, or the like. Uh, so you have to pray for them. Continue to ask God's blessing in their life. And, and pray that the Lord will open their, their heart and remove that root of bitterness. Now is it That's bad it. that you feel horrible that someone might have bitterness towards you? because, And then, you know, it, what it does to you, I mean... It hardens your heart and everything, so... Well, you know, I, I, I tell you, you know, it's good to pray for them, and, and you can... Um, there, there are times when you, when you pray, you can feel the burden of that's on them. You can feel that. You pray that out to the Lord. But um, as far as... as, far as there, 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 there's a place where you don't want to go. And that is, you never want to take responsibility for someone else's um, relationship. Okay. All right. I mean, you can apologize. You can do what's right. You can make amends that you're going to make. Uh, and you can show uh, your sorrow, and, 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 and you can forgive. But they have to be the ones who deal with whatever's in them. You can't, you can't change that. All right. Okay, now what if uh, that person has passed away and you haven't been able to say I forgive you or say that I'm no longer... You, you can still release them. I, I can't. Yeah. You can bring it to Jesus. What about him? His relationship with the Lord is his relationship with the Lord. You cannot change that. Okay. It is what it is. All right. So, um, but what you can do is release him to the Lord. Okay. And, 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 and forgive whatever happened and bless his memory and don't hold, don't hold his sin against him. Give it to God and move forward. Yeah. That's, that's what you do. But, you know, they're, they're, when, when, they're, when they're gone, you can release them, but, you know, their relationship with the Lord is whatever it is. You're, you're not going to change that. All right. All right, so anyway, that's the binding and the loosing. That, that's there. 
All right. So, given all that, you know, we're dealing with this question. Uh, discuss the uh, number seven. Discuss the importance of effective church discipline today. I think we talked a little bit about that. Is there any, anything that you want to comment on, or anything that you want to? Where are we? Discuss further. On number seven on page 20. Oh. <clears throat> Anything in particular you want to bring up or again it is it is an important topic if for no other reason that we don't really often talk about it. But it is something that, that the Bible spends time on. But it's probably one of the most difficult topics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To address. Yep. I, I, because we all, we all, I mean, the church, we recognize we're all sinners. Yep. It's a hard thing. It is. Well, I, I think you bring up something that, you know, you're, there are a lot of folks that are like, well, all right, yeah, you know, but I have my own. So how can I address this when I'm, I'm dealing with something else? Well, the answer to that is actually very simple. Address both. Mm -hmm. Of course. There you go. Address both. And, and we have to remember why. Yeah. Because we love. Because we love. Because, and because we, 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 we need to be a, a community that's focused on doing the will of God. And St. Peter says judgment begins at the house of God. If it begins with us, what's going to happen with the rest of the, the world? And if we're, going to, if we're going to be a people of integrity that God can use through obedience, that we need to take this seriously. Because he cares about every one of us. And he wants all of us to, to, to stand right. But that, that means that, that like, uh, you know, Jesus says here at the end of Matthew 18, you know, for where uh, two or three are gathered in my name, I'm sorry, the end of this passage, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He is there to lend assistance, to clean us up, to make us ready, to hear our prayers and to answer them. But that that requires us to come honestly and say, look, you know, we got this problem here. And, and it needs to be dealt with. We can't bury it in the sand, pretend it's not there, or say, oh, it's not too bad. So. It needs to be dealt with. But I do think there is, you know, there is something else, and that is that when 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 we're dealing with with sin, remember what what Jesus, how Jesus said to deal with it. You know, at the first instance this comes up, you don't need to go uh, take it to the newspaper. Just go talk to them. Go talk to them. Because it might be that they're not even aware that what they're doing is offensive. Or if they are, they might want to be free, they just don't know how. And so if you would approach them as a brother or as a sister, instead of them as the enemy that needs to be cleaned out, you know, that, that might be all that's needed. You know, you know, give them know where they need to be. But if you run into if you run into somebody uh, that absolutely refuses to repent, it's okay to take some more people over and say, look, we really need to talk about this. If they refuse that, then it is time. To say, look, you know, as as the body, this is not what represents Christ. And so, you know, you're welcome to come to worship. You're welcome to, to listen in on the sermon. Come to Bible study. 
but until until you repent, we're taking your member taking you off the membership roll. You're, you're not going to receive holy communion because we don't want you to be condemned, and we want you to to, to, to change. You got to change. This cannot continue. Now I realize that when you do that, sometimes people will say, "Well, fine, I'll go to the church." Can't help that. But you, we do need to 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 be consistently applying this. But I will say this too. You know, one of the things that that we need to do is is make sure that when we're dealing with church discipline, that we're majoring in majors and not in minors. I give you an example. I was at a uh, I was at a church uh, in the area, preaching on Lent, preaching during Lent, great time. Sat down, we're having a great discussion about the sermon, and this lady uh, who was there, a nice woman, really very nice, but she absolutely believes in her heart that anyone who plays privilege is going to hell. Really? Plays what? Because card plays privilege. Because playing cards is a sin. And I mean, she just went off on it, and and was and was looking at me to sit there because she had, evidently had some people in mind was looking at me to agree with her that these people were going to hell, and she wasn't getting it. I mean, but the thing is that that you know we need to major in majors. They're not minors. Now, I told her, I said, look, if somebody has a gambling problem, all right, there's a gambling problem. Yeah, mm-hmm. Let's take the cards away. But if somebody's just, you know, playing privilege, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly inclined to go over there and, and, and tell them that, that, you know, they need to stop playing cribbage or, or bring the church in there to, to, to tell them that they're excommunicated because they're playing cribbage. Get those cards over. <laughs> but now there was a time, but there, there, was, there was a time, by the way, I mean, we laugh, but there was a time when playing cards was, was taboo. And, and I, think, I think what it came down to was this. The reason it was taboo, the reason it was taboo was was it was one of those things where where it was kind of like dancing. You know, you you there was a there was a reason for the taboo there to begin with, and then it kind of went off the deep end. Um, one reason that dancing was not uh, appropriate or considered appropriate, and card playing was not appropriate, was one there there were people in witchcraft using cards. And so that was a problem. Also, there were people who were involved in pagan religions who were becoming Christian, and their dancing was lewd, crude, obnoxious, and, and was basically over... How about David, though? Yeah, David was He, he was known to dance. He was dancing. Out of his mind. Yeah, yeah. So, and, I mean, that's, that's the thing. So they were, when they were, when they would go into these places, they don't dance. Well, okay, don't dance to your pagan deities, but you're quite right. And you look in the in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, you got people who are. Oh, I'm sorry, but sometimes it's not very Northern European the way that they worship, because they are shouting to the. I mean, they're shouting so loud that people outside the city can hear them. That means the rocks are starting to shake. They are dancing with tambourines and jumping around and having a good time in the Lord. And they, and, and my, but the, the, the point here is, is that we need, we need to then bring everything to a biblical understanding. That's, the, that's it. And there's, uh, in there, when David was dancing, who was it, like his sister-in-law? His wife. His wife. Oh, was his wife. Not happy. <laughs> she got, yeah. Very proper. Happy. Not like her. <laughs> Not like it. Oh, by the way, you know, if you look at if you look at 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 um, at second no at first Chronicles when it talks about him dancing, you know one of the things that you'll find is that um, there there uh, her her being upset with him was not because some some commentators have put in there that he was dancing naked. All right, 
Like the Colonial First Chronicles, they, they, they tell you how he was dancing. He had a linen ephod on it. He was covered. All right? So he wasn't prancing around like, like a Baal worshiper. Okay? But he wasn't wearing his royal robes. He wasn't acting especially dignified. He wasn't behaving exactly like, like a king should. He was, he was actually, he was, he, was, he was having a great time. Glorifying the Lord. Pray, of course, remember, he was also a prophet. He was also a prophet. And he was, he was just entranced with God. And, 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 uh, and, and she gets all bent out of shape. And he says, too bad, so sad. And, and, and I, so, I mean, we, we do need to put all these things on a biblical basis. And, you know, what, what, let's make sure that what we're dealing with is an actual sin. A, as opposed to some tradition we laid on that might have had a good reason back in the day, but nobody's doing that now. You know, like people aren't dancing to a pagan deity. They're, they're actually worshiping the Lord and giving him the glory. Or, or you know, look what we're not, we're not, we're not playing. I'm not playing with tarot cards, and I'm not playing with this other stuff. I'm trying to beat my wife privilege, which, by the way, I do badly. I don't, I don't understand how it works with her, but I can be like 25 points ahead, and I'm still going to lose. <laughs> All right, it kind of brings up the point: is sin, sin, or is there degrees of sin? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot easier. It'd be a lot easier to do it to someone that everyone has their own idea of. Yeah, you yeah, know, that's bad. Yeah, and well, that's bad, but probably not as bad as that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be easy to think it. You know, in the case of adultery or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, yeah. you, you wouldn't have qualms about that. Right. But slander, greed, Cossum. drunkenness, you know, other yeah. things that's mentioned. Yep. Yeah. Be a little harder to do. Yeah, and but, you know. Yeah, and it's more of a. Yeah, and I, and I so is it? Uh, yeah, so I mean, the sin center is there a degree of sin? Well, I think you know when you look at when you look at at scripture, and you look at what's what's discipline. Uh, all sin comes under discipline. Yeah. All of it, uh, which means that you don't leave anything out. Yeah. So if you yeah. just would only do the. What we think are worst case scenarios, yep. we're basically be hypocrites. Right, we got to do them all. Yeah, got to do them all. And that, but you bring up an excellent point because that that actually is. So when when we when we talk to people, or even when when we when we preach, all right. One of the things one of the things I remember uh, somebody asking at one point to me was, you know, because this was true some years back. Because I was trying to, I was really trying to nail something home, um, and somebody said, "Well, why, why all this, you know, preaching against homosexuality? There are other sins in the Bible." And I, and my, and my, and why I said, "Well, you're absolutely right. There are." I said, "And I'm, I'm not trying to say that those other sins aren't sins." I said, "The reason I'm harping on this one thing right now." is because I don't see anybody, uh, at least on the church level, trying to say that being a thief is a good thing. Mm, yeah. But they are trying to say that this is a good thing. Good. But on the other hand, when it comes to discipline, we need to deal with it all. Yeah. I almost hate to bring this up, yeah. but if, if you talk about hypocrisy on, in, on discipline, you know, that's, and I agree with you, I mean, about homosexual. Yeah. 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 You know, terrible sin. Yeah. But uh, where I think the church has failed is on divorce. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus is pretty clear in the Bible about divorce. And that seems to be something, and I'm not just saying this church, but the church in general doesn't seem to want to really address that issue. Yeah, you know, they, the, it's, it's a good point. Actually, the, the, the thing they also don't want to, we don't, we don't also deal with it, is, uh, I actually brought this up at the. Um, I got invited to, to ask. I got invited to preach at the AFLC National Conference for one uh, one session. So I got up there preaching. It's the first time I preached at 
well over 500 people. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Make a church. <laughs> they're like, wow. People as far as the eye can see. And I was, and, and, uh, and, and I started preaching. And one of the things that I brought out was, because you know, they had this, the, the stand there about, because um, in Minnesota, they were at that time, they were voting on, on uh, the sanctity of marriage, or trying to vote on that. And so I brought that out. So, you know, over here, I, I was talking about how the church needs to repent. We need to repent. You know, we see all these things going on in our community and in our culture, and they're bad. But the root problem is that the church has not been the church. We have been uh, complicit by not calling out what sin is. And, and I said, probably because, look, we don't want to lose members. We don't want to lose the money. We don't, you know for all these reasons. I said, we need to repent. I said, over here we have this thing on uh, this this marriage amendment thing or whatever it is that they have in Minnesota. I can't remember right now what it was. I said, and by the way, I think everybody should vote in favor of it. I think you should. You know, defend marriage however you can. Absolutely. I said, but you know, while we're doing that, are we talking to our young people in our, in our, in our congregations and telling people who are living to each other, you need to stop that. Because that ain't pleasing to God. Or, you know, when we, when, and I did mention this, when, you, when, when we have people treating divorce like it's a merry-go-round, and they can just, you know, go one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another which is really just surreal monotony. I said, I said, what, are, are we, are we, how are we dealing with that? We're not dealing well with that. And so, you know, basically there's there's a there's a need for the church to be the church, and that means to treat everything. Everything that we need to deal with everything. Now, by the way, we need to deal with it in love. And we need to deal with it with, with an eye towards redemption. But if there's a reason, wait, look. How in the world can we as the church uh, speak with any integrity about greed? When we have pastors and synods and bishops and, and, and others telling folks, you know what? You give me a thousand dollars and God will give you ten. <laughs> Or you give me this, and God multiply it for you, brother. And then they build their mansions. And I'm sorry, but we need to call that for for what it is. By the way, do I believe in, in, in God's provision and prosperity? Yes, I do. But I don't believe that that's a license to breathe. I don't. It says very clearly. In Hebrews 13, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So I think that that there's a lot, but this this leads back to the other thing, and that is that because we haven't been upfront about these things very often, from the pulpit in particular, but because we haven't been upfront about many of these things. The church is not functioning as the light that she was intended to be. And that's exactly where the devil wants us. Because we can't we can't we can't function if we're not functioning in obedience. Go ahead. The problem the one thing I have a problem is with lying. Lying is sin. Mm -hmm. And yet I hear people saying, well, it's just a little white lie. Mm. <laughs> or, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Mm. And I have a hard time when people say, how are you today? And I finally mastered it by saying, I felt worse and I felt better. Because mm. I just don't want to talk about it sometimes. Yeah. And I figured, Sometimes it's hard not to lie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. 
But see now, here's let, let's let's look at the discipline of that. All right, discipline. All right, because this is a good example. Let's say that we have we have someone who has a problem with lying, like Myrtle. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. And uh, actually, what she really has a problem with is is, is trying to catch me with her cane, the lack. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, but she's getting, actually actually she's getting faster. She's getting healthier, and pretty soon she's gonna catch me. But praise the Lord. Yes. All right. But anyway, let's let's just say that for a moment, you're not a liar. But let's just say that you're having a problem with yourself yeah. with that. Now, if you admit that you have a problem. And I, I, I'm just coming before the Lord and I'm looking for the solution of that. Well, then that's the end of the discipline. The discipline, okay, well, let's lead you through this. And we're there to walk through you, with you through this, so that you can overcome that, that lie. So, you know, again, you know, the, the, I, sometimes I take my own life in my own hands because I, I'm actually, um, I see people. And they, um, they're, they're, they're in, a, in a spot that they probably shouldn't be in. And um, I, I really, I'm really not the kind of guy, I, I don't like to shock some of you, but I'm really not the kind of guy that likes conflict. Don't like it. <laughs> Seems odd because I feel, seem to be in it a lot. But, but I really do not, don't care for it. I mean, I don't, I don't like to put myself out there and say, hey, here I am, take a shot. <laughs> All right? I, I'm, I'm, and that's not who I am. But when I need to deal with something, I'll deal with it. All right. And I remember uh, going up to, to somebody and, and just saying, you know, and and, and this and, and you really do have to deal with it this way. You know, I'm not trying to get your business, and I'm not really trying to to to, to be a judge over you. But I know that you're having this issue. And if you will allow me to say, this is how you get free from that. And if you'll work with me, I'll work with you. We can make, you know, we, we, we can come to the Lord on this. You know, when they're open to that, well, that's the end of it, right there. Okay. You know, it only has to get, it only has to get tough when people refuse to repent. So I think one of the things. One of the things we need to do, though, as a church, and I'm not talking about just this congregation, I mean, as a whole, the body of Christ needs to do this better, especially in the United States, is we need to call sin a sin. Call it a sin. Call it what it is. You know, one of the amazing things is that if we would call it what it is, yeah, there are a lot of people that won't like it. But there are some people who will actually say, you know, I've been wondering about that. How do I get free? I'll give you an example. It's actually in England. There's a, um, I met this guy, uh, he's a pastor, uh, Sean Larkin. Uh, he works for the United Anglican Church. He's a, he's a, a minister there. And a very Bible-believing, spirit-filled group. And um, he preached up in Munich, did a nice, excellent job with that. But he, uh, he was talking about the fact that uh, he's in England where homosexuality and homosexual relations and other relationships are just fine and dandy with the state. But he will have, he and his community of faith, they continue to stand on the biblical principles. And so he will have uh, meetings where he will invite the homosexual community to come and share with them what the Bible says about sexuality, man and woman, marriage, and the like. And he says, and you know, you're, you're going to get activists. They're always going to be there. The ones who won't repent. He said, but, he said, even in a culture that has become so saturated, he said, even more saturated than what you have in the United States right now, Invariably, after these talks, he says, I get dozens of people who come up to find out more about this and, and how to repent. So, 
it, 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 we need we need to understand that we do need to call and say, will everybody repent? No. But there is the other flip side of that. God is calling many of these people to repentance, and, and, and they just need the urging of the church to say, well, come here. Come here. That's, that, that really is what church discipline is about, saying, no, we're not going to ignore sin so that we can be the proper instrument of God's power on earth. what it is so that those of us who are where, wherever we are we, we can get out of it and get back on course. Yeah. You see I think the problem there and I'm not trying to say that there's anything good I, I believe that's terrible yeah. but just to, to try to make that that's worse than something else I think that's the impression we get. Yeah. 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 And there that's not good. No. No. It has to be we have to, we have to make, but see here's the thing and you're bringing up you're bringing up an excellent point. And then I remember uh, a uh, a reporter talking to me. I was getting careful about talking to reporters. And uh, and he was with the Grand Forks Herald at the time. And we were having two meetings. And the reason it was on this issue because that was the issue of the day. And um, he said to me, "Well." He said, I guarantee you, I wonder what they say, I guarantee you, don't know anything about me, but I can guarantee you. <laughs> um, I guarantee you that, that you, don't, you don't deal with, with heterosexuals this way. And I said, well, you would be wrong. I said, I have dealt with, with it exactly the same way. And, um, but, one of the things we do need to say is that sin is sin. Gossip is sin. Lying is sin. You know, we have actually, you know, you know what, you know what, you know what the most, um, <laughs> somebody, somebody said it this way, the most popular sin in the American church, you know what it is? What? Gluttony. No. I have to admit this. What? It's a sin. It is a sin. It's a sin. No, I mean, you know, I, but, 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 but we, we all have to, you know, fess up. Yeah. You know, it's like I told somebody once. I said, you know, when, I come, when, we, have, when we have confession here at the beginning of, of, of the service, I said, I'm not just leading you in that. I am confessing my sin. I have I'm, I, I, I have sin and I pray before God every Sunday, every day. There are attitudes that need to change. You know, sometimes we forget that, that we can sin just but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 we're told 
that we're not to grumble and complain. Yeah. <laughs> how many how many of us have a problem with grumbling and complaining? I mean about anything. I mean we, we, we can grumble I mean we grumble and complain about our politicians, about the media, and, and by the way, it's not that they don't deserve it. But still, nevertheless, we're grumbling and complaining. And guess what? They might have sinned, and now we are. Okay. All right? <laughs> now we are. How about now, this one? Now we're in sin. We should stay on our knees. We should stay on our knees. We're not supposed to be prideful either, right? Right. I, I have to remind myself all the time, don't be proud of that. You're wrong. You can't be proud. Well, of now wait a minute. Right, All right. Now, now I want. I want. I want. I, 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 now, it's, it's okay. Are it's just a little thing. No, no. Listen to me. It, it's not pride. pride. It's not. It's not pride. To be happy that you did a job well done, because everything you do, you do in the glory of God. That's that's not pride we're talking about. The pride is when you're. What when it's, look at me, how wonderful I am. How about like, I, like I'm thinking right now how I planted my flower bed and I sat back and I was so proud of it. And I said, wait, I can't be proud of that. No, you should be. Yeah, you should. No, That's like no it's, like, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's all on the snow now. It's, 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 well, I don't really be proud of the snow. Anyway, the, 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 it's, when, 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 you are, when you have, when you have done something well, okay, it, it's okay to appreciate the beauty of it. It's not okay to get a big head okay. and, and, and put yourself in the place of God. Oh. All right? There's a, there's a difference. Now, admittedly, there's a fine line. Yeah. And you can fall off one way or the other. But just because... You're you're happy with a job well done does not mean that you've fallen into the in, into the sin of pride. But we do have to watch pride. You know what? You know, I'll give you I'll give you one example of that, okay. which pastors can fall into very very easily. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, that was a great sermon there, Rob. <laughs> I've never heard that gospel as as as, as like that in years. Wow! Yeah, well, thank you very much. Of course, I only gave half of it now. Another half tomorrow. Come back, it's really gonna be awesome then. Because I'm just that good. You know? I mean, the heck can go yeah. like that. You know, another thing that can happen, and 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 this is where now I mean now I'll be I'm, 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 I'm being I'll be very very serious about this, and, and it's something that I a, a lot a, a lot of times, especially if they're if they're working by the gifts of the Spirit, in some things, they have to be very careful of this. Because it says in, in Psalm 115, not, not to me, not to my name, but to your name, give the glory. All right? So when you're praying for somebody, or, or you, you, you now have a, you know, a, a reputation, where people will come and pray for you, what does that tend to do with pastors? <laughs> you know, but anyway, the, the thing is that, that that that's why when when uh, I, you know, when, when people will talk about what the Lord has done, and then they start putting my name in there, I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> I did nothing, zero. I was just basically a mail carrier. I I, I handed you the the letters from God. He took care of it. You know? so, so we should stop saying that was a good sermon. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> They're all good. Don't let me don't 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 don't, don't let me get away with it. Don't encourage it. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's it, we 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 all have that possibility. You know. So I think I think that's something that we all. It's good to look at your life now. Here's here's the thing. 
Let the Holy Spirit be the one to show you where you need to repent. You know why? Because if you start digging in your own life, you're going to fall under condemnation because you're going to look at yourself and see all kinds of ugliness there. Mm -hmm. And you're not ready to deal with all of that yourself. You need to let the Holy Spirit show you what, needs to be let, what, what, what you need to repent of now. And what I found, actually, is that you know, I'll be walking on my treadmill or I'll be uh, doing something else and, and the Lord will bring to my memory something that happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago or when I was a kid and there, there was an attitude that I had or I, I did something over here and, and I know it's the Lord because when the Lord shows me that he's never showing it to me to rub my nose in it he shows it to me so that I can renounce it and repent of it and walk new so let the Holy Spirit be the one to direct that you know, you don't need to dig. And of course, you know, for some of us, it's pretty obvious anyway. <laughs> Sometimes the Holy Spirit works for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> don't you hate it when your spouse speaks truth to your life? Yes. It's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> but it's God. Anyway, the, the, the thing is that, that don't... It's not about condemnation. Even church discipline is not about condemnation. It's about getting right. And getting free from the bondages that hold us back from doing what God wants us to do. It's like, um, I, I used to be a glutton. Um, I used to, uh, and not on purpose, it's just that when I ate, I was afraid, it was like, this is my last meal to so get it, eat and eat and eat. And I crave more and more and more. And um, last year I decided that it was wrong and so I went on a diet and I started watching. And it lasted two whole weeks and then I was glad back to regular. And then the first part of this year, um, and God kept making me feel guilty about it and everything. And then I finally asked him to take away my desires because I couldn't do it myself. And he did. And that's the only reason I'm losing weight. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I don't, um, I don't have those bad desires. Um, I still like food, but I don't go overboard on it. And it doesn't hurt to have a cookie now and then. That's not being a glutton. <laughs> if you have 12, that's probably a glutton. Now you can have one more piece of bread. <laughs> See, I, I freely admit to it. I, I, I can't make something like if I had that bag of cookies at home, yeah. it'd be gone in a couple of days. I, I just could not walk by that bag without having one or two. Yeah. So I don't at home. I don't make things like that because I just know that. It would be I gone in one night, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's with me. When I buy candy, I buy a couple bags of candy, and I'd open up one. By the time I got from that was like to start weather, it was empty. Yep. Because after one, I just had to have another one, had to have another one. Yeah. It's an addiction. Yes. Well, there is there 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 is an element that comes in on that with with regards to addictive behavior and, and things like that, and it's a spiritual issue as well as a physical one. And that's why you have to bring it to God because He's the one that can deal with both. And that's really what we're here for. We're supposed to be able to help each other move move on and move out of those things. Now, like for me, you know, that kind of thing, and everybody has their own their own area of weakness that the enemy likes to use or your flesh will go with. See, for me, I can make things like that all day. 
and really, I, I, I don't crave it. On the other hand, if you put lobster in front or some kind of seafood, man, I will go after that like, like a shark in bloody water. I mean, it is embarrassing. I mean, they put the bib on me for a reason. You know, I'm just this sloppy guy. Ah, ah. Oh, hey, I need some shell. <laughs> so, you know, this <laughs> is why they don't have that in my house. But, you know, it, it's, it's, for everybody, it's a little different. It may be. All right, you had something. I do have something I was going to ask. Now, we're talking about Addressing things now, within the church, but also like how do you do this within your family? Because you know how family members, if you have to approach them about things, yeah, and it's like obviously you don't want to offend them because still you know want them to come to the holidays. Mm -hmm. and, well, you want your house and your whole baby, so yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. So how how do you? I mean, with love. But well, turn turn that turn that turn that to Matthew are you still there? Matthew 18? Yeah. Because this this works this works with families too. Alright. To a to a to a to a certain degree, it works. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So I think one of the things that, that you do even within families. I mean, really, one of the things we have to remember is, really, the church is, we are a family. We're the family of God. And we also have other family connections with blood. They may or may not be believers. Uh, but how you deal with them is with the same attitude. And that is, got a problem, we're going to deal with it one-on-one -on -one, uh, with an attitude of, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to to, 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 to cause you pain or trouble, but you know, this behavior over here, I have a problem with that. Or, you know, it could be, by the way, that maybe you want to go to them and say, look, I'm sorry. I I made a mistake. You don't have to, you know, get on top of the Quonset the hut and tell the whole world, but you can just go visit with them and, and let it be done. All right? But it, it should be a one on one. Uh, thing, and then um, if they if, if you're in agreement, great. You know if not, you know it might be good to say, look, you know, cousin Bob here and and uh, and, and cousin Sandy, uh, look, we, this is the problem that 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 I see, and and uh, we've had this problem before. And they can hear, and they, sometimes they might even say, "Yeah, you know that happened in our house too." So, you know, bringing that in, you say, "Look, this cannot continue, or we need to change some things here." That's fine. Yeah, you know, the one thing you really can't do is, uh, well, let me rephrase that. You can't choose your relatives, but what you can do, but you can say, just just as we do here. Look, if you're going to continue to fool around like that, then, you know, I'll be glad to send you a plate from the Thanksgiving table, but you ain't coming in this house. I'll give you one example uh, in, our, in, our own, in, in our own family, all right? So, had, a, had, a, um, had an issue where uh, there was some... Uh, some child abuse and shenanigans going on in the family. And at every gathering, every gathering, every gathering, somebody was going to blow up and cause problems. I mean, for everybody. It was just going to be like a hurricane just come in and cause trouble. And, and finally, uh, guess who got elected to go visit with the family member? <laughs> right? And and basically visiting with them 
So, what well, you know, you're, you, we, we like having you up. We, we like having your family here. We like all of that. That's just fine. But we, I, I, I said, we just can't tolerate this kind of behavior. You know, I mean, the, the mouth is foul. Uh, you, you get violent. Uh, there are children uh, in the in, in the house. We're we're, we're not going to have that. So if you can't control yourself then we'll be glad to send you a plate, but uh, we, we can't have you here. Can't do it. Uh, eventually, they just accepted themselves and said they weren't, they weren't coming anymore. Which was fine, because, you know, they were saying they can't control themselves, and that meant, you know, hey, I don't have to hide their eyes. Cool. <laughs> okay, it's a little, it's a little extreme, but you know, the, the, the thing is that it was, it was not, it was not a good scene. Everything was a whole lot more peaceful, but you, 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 you can't not deal with that. You have to deal with it, and, and again, deal with them in love. But nevertheless, you, you do have to call it for what it is, and say, you know, we, we can't have that. Can't have that. Because we don't want that, we don't want that in the family. Don't want it with the kids. No, don't want that. And you know, you, you can offer to help them. You know, where do you need help in this? How can how can I help you with this? But but also remember, they they they, they may not want help. In which case, you can't make them do anything. You can't. You, 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 you can't. You might want to, but it's not going to happen. That's why that, that's why you know it, it really is true that real conversion, real conversion, it is is never compelled. It's never compelled. Real conversion is a real meeting with the Lord, when real change comes. He brings the change. You can help maybe leave them there, but they don't want to be led. There's nothing you can do about it. But it is a process too. It is a process. You can keep you can keep loving them and keep sharing, but ultimately it's the Lord that's going to be doing the converting, not you. Yeah. Anything else? No. All right. Well, we'll just. Close on that note, and then we'll uh, we'll finish up on the rest of chapter five of Acts. Um, we'll finish that up on the twentieth of November. We should pray for those people in Texas. Yes, um, we'll pray for them. Yeah, there was a video where the the pastor and his wife actually spoke about it. Mm -hmm. Both their daughters that. Boy, I tell you what, you know, I, I, it, it's hard to lose a child, but I can't, I, it, it, you know, when, 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 when my son died, at, at, at least he died in peace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as opposed to seeing your daughter shot up. Mm -hmm. Wow. I can't, I can't imagine that. But they handled it. Yeah. They did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow, God gave them the strength to get through that. Mm -hmm. And they spoke and mm -hmm. he, they handed all the glory. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. did you guys see it? I, yeah. I, just, like, I just saw just a little bit where they talked about where they didn't want to take away from the others. Uh, yeah. It'll be highlighted. Yeah. The grief, you know, yeah. Yeah. Enough. Yeah, I thought that that was a pretty good thing. Yeah, yeah it is. Wow. Well, at the end of it, they said, we may not, we don't lean on our own understanding, and we're going to rely that the Lord's going to take care of it. And I mean, they just kept yeah. lifting up the Lord. And I, I was, it was amazing. Yep. You see that strength. Yep. 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 Well, and that's what we need to see more. Mm -hmm. That's what the world needs to see more. Do you think with like, because like literally you think about it with the Vegas thing, the Halloween thing, Sunday's thing, like yeah. with these past three months they've seen, because on Halloween there was that one guy that ran into a park and eight were killed in New York, I don't know. 
I guess I never really knew too much about it. But yeah, he 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 he, uh, he ran a truck and you. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but like with all these things, and then you look at the responses of the Christians mm -hmm. and how firmly they're just, you know, having that peace, and they're not setting things on fire or throwing things yeah. <laughs> like rioting. Mm -hmm. They're at like they're just solid, and it's so cool to see that. Well, and that's and that's the grace of God working. Mm -hmm. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. All right, well, let's let's pray for that. For sure. Any, anything else? Good. South Africa. Okay. Okay. What? Well, so say more about that. Well, um, within the past year, they've had over six thousand people have been murdered on their farmsteads, mm -hmm. and that's their goal. It's a racial war, more or less. The um, the colored people are coming into these farms, and whether they're workers or whatever, and they're murdering the families in their homes. Mm -hmm. And the government isn't doing anything, and they're not going after these people. And they're just, they go in, they have hammers, and they beat children, old, elderly, and they, and they leave them, and they'll, sometimes they burn down the farmsteads, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they'll leave their bodies just strung all over. And, um, I mean, Van, you know, you know, a lot of his he friends have stories, yeah, yeah. and he doesn't talk about it much, but I know a couple years ago, one of his friends went into a, a barn stall and found his dad being with hammers. Oh, wow. And um, then there was, like, a kid that was seven, and he had to help defend his mom and dad. They survived, but they ended up shooting these people that were in their homes. Mm. And, I mean, this is happening daily. You know, they're losing all these people there, and they're trying to work in their farms, yeah. and they can't because... So it's yeah. it's there it's just really bad. We'll pray for them for sure. Yeah, and I told I told Van he had an opportunity to share that in church so we could pray for that as well. We'll do that. I also want to want to say I, you know the, the thing that comes to my mind is it's not the answer, but the thing I'm thinking about with those South Africans if they're like if they're like Van and all, we just come come here. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, really. I guess Trump, <laughs> a lot of work. Trump had a, had a thing that he spoke on them, mm -hmm. and he talked about doing some.